going on YouTube. Uh, so as you can probably imagine, ever since I started building these uh, these flip stops, I've want, want, been wanting to try anodizing in the shop instead of sending them out. But uh, I'm always a little bit afraid of the process. Then Jocko Whatever posted an anodizing video just a couple of weeks ago, and it kind of broke the fear for me. I went ahead and ordered all the stuff. But to be honest with you, I've had a lot of trouble over the last couple of weeks, but I think I got a pretty good process going now. So I just want to give you guys a whole bunch of information on anodizing and the shortest videos possible. So let me see how I make out with this. A little disclaimer before we get started. Um, I'm no professional at anodizing. I just started doing this a couple of weeks ago and I've just been researching off the internet. A few things to know, of course, this is battery acid. It is uh, diluted quite a bit, but even though it's diluted, you still want to wear the proper PPE. Uh, another note, Caswell's, great reference on the internet. They got a forum, they got this uh, how to anodize manual, which I've been referencing like crazy. This is where I bought the dyes and stuff. Great website, definitely wanna check them out. All right, let's get started. All right, so the anodizing tank itself is made up of a few different components. You got the battery acid, which is diluted down quite a bit. It's one part battery acid to three parts distilled water. Then you have a cathode, which is, uh, I'm using a piece of lead, uh, lead flashing actually from the home center. You can use aluminum, but aluminum will deteriorate over time where the lead will basically last forever. Um, one note with the uh, aluminum flashing though, there is like a coating on that, which has to be sanded off before you use it. Next is the anode. Now I just have aluminum bar crossing this, but titanium wire is what I'm gonna hang the part on and that's what your positive charge will go to. And then finally, I have this little fish tank air pump. And all that's doing is add some agitation in the tank because you could potentially get some bubbles build up on your part and that could cause a defect. And the agitation will just knock those bubbles off. All right, so before we get started on that, there's two things that have to be taken into consideration. One is the surface finish. So how shiny the part is and two, how we're gonna clean it. So. Coming right off the mill, I got a pretty nice shiny surface, but you do see mill marks in there. And to remove that, I just hit it with a scotch brake pad, the green one. And that kind of mats it down a little bit, but it still gives you a fairly shiny surface. So the shinier the surface is, like if I go over the buffing wheel, it will look more metallic when I anodize it. And then the more, say if I put it on the belt sander and the more rough the texture is, the more matte the anodizing will look. So the scotch brake pad is kind of like a happy medium and that's what I've been doing. Now the same before cleanliness is obviously very important, but there's a simple test that you can do to make sure that you're there. And I'm just gonna demonstrate this really quickly. This part here is a dirty part. This one here I have cleaned or degreased and I'm just gonna spray it with a bottle of water. And notice how this one kind of bubbles up. Now if I do the same thing to this one, See how it almost like sheets off of there? That's called the water break test. And as long as your part passes this water break test, you are clean enough. So with that in mind, all I did to do to get this to break the water break test is scrub it with a degreaser. It was just simple green degreaser. So after the part has been degreased, a lot of people go to the etching step. And what you use for that is lye or drain opener, 100% lye though. Mix that with some water, you put your aluminum part in and it etches the surface and that will really get rid of any leftover oils. But uh, the problem with this is it also affects your surface finish. So when you etch, it actually eats away at the aluminum and you get, it takes away some of your shine. So you're gonna be left with a little bit more of a matte anodizing. So I choose to skip that step altogether. I mean, if as long as you pass the water break test, you don't need to etch the part. So for me, after the greaser goes right to the anodizing tank. All right, so now that the parts are all clean, we can talk about racking. Now, as I was saying earlier, I bought some titanium wire, but that's totally not necessary. Aluminum TIG wire works great. It's just the thing with aluminum TIG wire is it's a one-time use. So after you've used it in an anodizing, it gets anodized as well and becomes an insulator and no longer will get a good connection. So you just have to keep throwing these out and use the new ones where the titanium, you just keep using over and over. Now to rack it, I kind of make this loop shape here and I stuff that in the hole. Now you really do have to make sure you got a good connection here because if you lose your connection or it gets anodized underneath that connection, you're gonna lose your charge and it just won't work anymore. So 
Make sure it's good and tight in there. See, that's too loose. All right. There. Another thing I forgot to mention about the anodizing tank, uh, just sitting here by itself, it doesn't emit any dangerous fumes or anything, as far as I know. But as soon as you start the anodizing process and add power to it, it does give off a hydrogen fume. I guess it's not crazy bad or anything like that, but you definitely want to do it in a ventilated area. I actually purchased some fume suppressant by, from Caswell's. You just put a couple of tablespoons of this and it's supposed to basically eliminate all of the fumes, but just still to be on the safe side, I take it up to the garage and make sure the door is open. I don't want to take any chances with this stuff. Now, of course, you don't want your parts to touch the cathode, so you want to make sure it's nice and centered. And I like to put it right over where the bubbles are going to shoot out. And one thing I forgot to mention, from the time you clean the part to the time it goes in the tank, you do not want to touch it with your hands. Got to wear gloves. Any fingerprints at all will definitely show through in your finish. A uh, quick note about power supplies. I picked up this guy on Amazon. It was like 80 bucks or something like that. It only goes up to about five amps, but that's plenty for the parts I use. And I say that because a lot of people just use battery chargers. The thing is with battery chargers, you really lack the control because you should be setting your amperage to how much surface area your part has. Uh, Caswell says four and a half amps per square foot, which is about 0 0.03 amps per square inch. And with that being said, if you're a little bit less in amperage, the part's going to take on a lot more dye, but not be quite as hard or as durable anodizing surface. Uh, the flip side of that, if you put too many amps in, it's going to give you a really hard anodized surface, but it won't take that dye as well. So for me, dye is more important. So I stay a little bit on the light side of that, about 0 0.02 amps per square inch on my parts. And that seems to be giving me the best, uh, I don't know, in between as far as how well it takes to die, but still gives me a durable surface. All right, so I can go ahead and hook the negative up to the piece of lead and the positive to my part or on the titanium wire. And I already have the unit set to the proper amperage, which mine works out to be about 0.3 amps. And time-wise, there's a calculator you can look up on the Caswell Celics, but I've been just doing an hour for everything and that seems to work fine. Now, one thing to mention is the tank temperature. Um, if you're doing bigger parts, it could tend to warm up and you'll have to cool that tank down. You wanna keep it under 75 degrees. But with my small parts, and I actually take this whole system, put it up in my upstairs garage, which isn't heated, it's just a lot more ventilated. I actually have to warm it up. So that's what the little fish tank heater is. I just try to keep it above 60 degrees. So I'll take this upstairs and uh, let it run for about an hour. Okay, so the anodizing process is all done. Now we're gonna quickly talk about dyes. The dyes need to be heated up. They say to be about 140 degrees. I find it varies from color to color and you just kinda of gotta play with it to find out what temperature that color likes. So uh, this green one, 140 seems to work fine. The blue one, I'm having a lot of problems with, but I do find I get a little bit more success if I'm a little bit cooler. Now, as far as buying dyes, a lot of people use this uh, clothing type dye. You can get it basically anywhere. And although it does work, the colors, like you can see, the colors aren't super close. Like that's more pink than purple. And believe it or not, this is the gray. So the colors hit or miss, even though it does work. So keep that in mind. I found the ones you get from Caswell's, the actual anodizing dyes do produce a better a better color uh, these are like 20 bucks and these are like seven bucks so there is a price difference but i think it's worth it worth the extra money to heat them up i'm just using these tea kettles see this one's at 140 already uh they work really well because for one they're only like 14 bucks each to buy and uh two they heat them up really quick just use a little meat thermometer to monitor the temperature and I just do one at a time because I'll trip a breaker if I don't. So got one of blue and one of green. I'm really hoping the blue is going to work because I really, really like the blue color. I just tend to get a lot of defects in it with the blue. So we'll let this one heat up a little bit more. One thing I definitely highly recommend 
is when you take the parts out of the acid, obviously rinse it well with distilled water, always distilled water, but then do a baking soda rinse and that will help to neutralize any of the acid what's left over on the part because any acid from the part what lands into these dye tanks is gonna give you a blemish, almost guaranteed. The better you can rinse those parts now, the better luck you're gonna have with a better looking part. So I'll just take these out, give them a quick spray down right in the tank here that, look to be honest with you this gets most of the acid off just doing this and then i'm really going to slosh it around this fly car well even or i'll even let it soak in here for a little bit again if you get acid on here it's going to cause you problems so now the time just varies based off of how dark you want the part but most people go for about a maximum of 15 minutes you'll know if you're anodized right away because it will start taking up some of the dye almost instantly and you kind of want to swish it around a little bit too, make sure there's no bubbles left over. And you can see there, it's already taken a lot of the dye already. See if I can get these up. This is, so they've literally been in the tank for 10 seconds here. And that's where we're at for color. Like, so it really soaked it up really good, which is awesome. Just love it. This is, it's a really fun process, to be honest with you. Just experimenting to see what uh, kind of results you can get. Um, of course, you can mask if you want to. You can kind of do fade-ins and fade-outs with it. There's all kinds of things you can do with it. it I highly recommend trying it if you're, if you're building anything out of aluminum. It's a pretty neat process. A uh, few final notes here while we're waiting for that to soak. Disposable of acid, uh, if you got to get rid of your acid. A lot of people say you could just neutralize it with baking soda and then dump it down the drain. I don't know if that's correct or not. I'm personally not going to do that. Uh, it would take a lot of baking soda for one, and it would just be like a slurry and a big mess. For me, I know that my landfill takes household hazardous waste and before I even bought the acid, I called them and asked them to make sure they would take waste battery acid and they said it wasn't a problem. So that's where I'll dispose of mine once I'm done with this. So the last step is just to seal the parts in this boiling water. That kind of just seals up all the pores and locks that dye in. Uh, you're supposed to boil it for about 15 minutes. So, you know, all right. So these parts have been in the boiling water for about 15 minutes now and they are all sealed up. And they look really good, actually. I really like the, uh, actually, I really like both of these colors. All right, guys, make sure you let me know in the comments down below what color you like more. Um, I think I lean more towards the green, but uh, the blue is really nice too. Uh, troubleshooting. You can see you got a dark spot right here, and same thing with this along the edges. That there is probably due to the tank temperature being too hot. So if you cool the dye tank and just leave it in there for longer, that should fix that problem. This guy here, it just didn't anodize. It didn't take the dye at all. So I'm not really sure what happened on this one, but it definitely didn't anodize the way it should have. This guy here, this is what I'm talking about. This is probably uh, leftover acid in between going from the uh, battery acid to the dye tank. So really want to make sure that part is rinsed well before it hits the dye. All right, guys, I really hope you guys like this video and you pick up some good information here. I'm Ryan Odwell. Thanks for watching.